Oh my. Oh my. The the worship. Oh my. Oh my. Come on, let's just come on. I could almost get emotional because it's so special what God's doing here. This might be familiar to some, never grow familiar when there's an outpouring of the presence of the Lord. For it's always special, it's always unique. Guard it, protect it, cultivate it, go after it. I tell you what, it is so special what God is doing here. And to be asked to be a part of it, to be given place with my voice, I'm humbled, beyond humbled. I, I, I told Sean, I said, the fact they would trust me to speak into this moment of what God's doing. What God is doing here is so unique. We've been, we've been contending for it. And people are dialing in even now online from all over the world, all over the nation, because there's a portion here in Peoria, Arizona. There is a revival hub, a well of revival. God is doing it in Arizona. God's doing it in your city. He's doing it in your state. And this is a watering hole for the nations. Not just the nation, but the nations. Well, people are gonna come and take and go around the world. And there is gonna be an impartations online. There is. Not everyone's gonna be able to be here present in person, but because of the airwaves, God has anointed the airwaves and people are gonna tune in. Churches are gonna hold services to live stream on Friday night, the service is here. People are gonna show this on Sunday morning. They're gonna cancel their service at per usual because something special has happened in Peoria, Arizona. And God is moving. And you're a part of it. I want you to put up your hands. I just felt like the Lord says, I'm increasing the capacity to carry revival. I'm increasing the capacity to push the limits of what they've known before. That there's barriers that are being pressed through tonight and this weekend. The Lord says he's risen the standard, so to speak, because the floodwaters have increased on the drive here. I heard the Lord say, there's a new water table measurement because the waters have increased in depth in the house. And I saw like a pencil in the Lord's hand. He says, I'm marking deeper waters and fresh start this weekend. So Lord, I pray a fresh outpouring. Lord, I thank you your presence is here. I thank you, God, that you've already caused an awakening in this city. Lord, the sound of worship that has come from this platform is gonna go to the nations. Lord, I thank you for the sound of breakthrough and revival. Lord, forgive us for the statement of that's that's enough, God, that's good. Oh God, forgive us for we think, well, that that's good enough. Lord, break our good enough boxes. Break the boxes where we go, well, that was awesome. Break our awesome boxes. Break our that was incredible boxes. Break our paradigm, even right now, of what revival looks like. Break every box we have and expand our capacity, God, of not only encountering you, but carrying you. I just see the Lord, it's like he has a, a jar of oil and I just see him pouring it over each and every one of us right now. I just, from the from the flight from Burbank, we, we flew him from Burbank 
I literally was on a Southwest flight having an encounter with God. And I felt the Lord just pour oil on my head. And he said, open your mouth. I'm on Southwest Airlines with my mouth open. I don't even care. And he starts pouring oil in my mouth. And the whole flight, I felt washing, washing, washing of his oil. I came into worship and there was more oil and I just feel like the Lord is literally taking his jar from heaven and he's just saying, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because my husband talks about a cistern has limitations and all those cisterns are pitchers and they can even be large, they're containers. The Lord says, I've called you not to be a container of revival, but I've called you to be a well of revival. So Lord, I thank you that there is a well of your oil, a well of your presence, a well, Lord, of you Holy Spirit in this place. Every boundary broken. And the Lord is challenging your comfort zone this weekend. I heard the Lord say, how can I increase your capacity if you'll only stay in your comfort zone? So Lord, we agree and we say yes to getting uncomfortable if that's what it takes to increase capacity. We let go of the comfort zone. We get uncomfortable. Can we just say, do whatever you want to do? Because this is about you. This isn't about us. This is all about you. This is all about you. We just thank you, Jesus, for what you've already done, for what you're going to do, for what you're going to continue to do. And thank you, God, for trusting us for trusting Fresh Start, for trusting pastors in this house to carry revival, reformation. Jessica, I hug her every time, and I'm like, I love your sound. I love your sound. You guys have tapped into it. I mean, just guard this thing. Go after this thing. I just heard the Lord said, guard the unity on this platform like a pit bull. Like, guard the unity on this platform. Because God is doing a unique thing on the worship team the sound. You're going to train other worship teams. I saw a picture in worship and each of you had someone standing beside you or behind you like shadowing you all on this platform and they were literally looking at you and they were just imitating and I said God what is that? He says literally worship teams are going to come here and just watch what you guys do and then I saw you guys sitting on the platform and just walking through like, this is our process. We're not saying this is the process, but this is our process. Let, let, let us bring you into our process. And they're gonna take portions of that because what you guys carry was always created to be imparted. It was always created to be imparted. So get ready because the Lord is individually inviting each of you to increase your time at his presence and at his feet. Not a works thing, not even a certain amount of time, but I just saw when the wooing of the Lord comes, as you each and every one of you, because every one of you are an important thing. One person isn't more important than the other. This is a team effort. 
And as you each respond to the wooing of the Lord, it's going to unlock things that are needed for the next encounter. There's appointments in the worship of heaven that you're going to get exposed to, so to speak. Like there's impartation, there's deposits that are going to happen in these invitations. There really is encounter coming to each and every one of you individually of what God's going to do. Amen. Will you be ready at the end of service? Because you know I'm going to call you back up. Okay. Because you know I can't get enough of this worship team. You guys are amazing. Great job. Great job. I said it before, but thank you so much for trusting me. Thank you. And just for inviting me into your revival family, I gladly take a seat at that kitchen table. Glad I'm honored. I'll sit in the back. I'll sit in the last seat. If I just get in the room, I'm stoked. I'm just, I'm honored. So thank you for trusting me. And I'm really excited. My mom and dad are here. The I And I might be biased. And that's okay if I am, but I'm convinced I have the best parents. They're, they're absolutely incredible. And they asked us, they said, we'd love to go on a ministry trip with you and Sean. Sometimes when Sean's not able to come with me, if I go do a women's event where it's just women only, obviously Sean's like, eh, I'm good. Uh, I'll meet you at the next one. My mom, at times when her schedule um, is free, she'll able, she's able to come with me, but they have never been on a trip with Sean and I together. So they said, what trip? Uh, what is the right church? And we said, without doubt, Fresh Start. That is where you want to go. That, that is where you want to go. And, it, and I'm not falsely bragging on you. We get asked all the time because we're just so privileged. We get to travel and minister um, around the nation and beyond. And people always say, where is God moving? And we always say, Fresh Start. If We always tell pastors, uh, staffs, people that are continuing for the more, we're like, take your team. For a revival weekend, get to Peoria, Arizona. Get to Fresh Start. Get an impartation and take it back. I mean, we literally have told dozens of churches this. And so there's probably a, a few sneaky visitors that come in simply because they've heard about this amazing church. Because what God's doing here is so special. So I'm so glad my mom and dad are here. I'm excited for them. It's awesome. And then my amazing husband, I always say he's my greatest gift. He's my greatest gift. He's my favorite preacher. I get to sit underneath him most every weekend, and I always get something because he's a man of prayer. And I just, it is my greatest honor to be his wife. I love doing life with you, and I love you. So just, it's a joy. We're going to dive right in. Is that okay? That's kind of my style. That's kind of my style. I'm going to share with you, I'm going to speak to you as a prophetic voice tonight. I may not do the most refined teaching. I think it's okay because uh, I, I can teach and whatnot. I can break it down for you. But tonight I heard the Lord say he wanted me to be really specific in the word that I brought you because it's a word of strategy. You know, there is a strategy room of heaven. So I have been praying that there is a corporate encounter, that corporately we are given access to the strategy room of heaven because we are contending for breakthrough in, of course, this city and beyond in this nation. I'm going to be specifically speaking to America, but I know there may be other nations that are listening. I want you to grab this for your nation as well, although I'll be speaking about what God has spoken to me about America but Fresh Start Church Revival Week, and I felt like the Lord said, come and bring the blueprint for where we're at as a nation right now. So that's what I'm going to do tonight. I just feel like line by line, precept upon precept, we're going to break it down on what I believe the Lord is saying. The first thing he told me as we were beginning to enter into 2018, and what's interesting about that is I'm not someone that is necessarily driven by the calendar in the natural. 
But this year, I knew 2018, the calendar and the natural, as the time turned in 2018, January 1st, I knew something had shifted in the spirit. I said, Lord, what's going on? I can feel a shift. It's a different wind in my face, so to speak. And I felt an openness in the spirit that I had not experienced. There was some increased opposition, but there was an increased encounter realm that was available. I said, Lord, what's going on? He says, America has entered a new era, not a new season, not a new chapter, not a new year but a new era in history. We have entered in 2018, it marks a new time in our country. I was, I was talking with my husband probably a few months ago. He began to share a story, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but have you, have you ever had someone share a story and it provokes and reminds you of a story in your own life? that possibly you have forgotten about, you haven't given thought to it. But as he was sharing, there was a encounter that he had with a person that was possessed demonically, and he had an encounter with that, and there was a, a, an interesting situation. And I turned to him and I said, you know, something like that happened to me a long time ago. And I don't know about you, but sometimes things happen and we just move right on. I didn't think about it, I didn't give it a lot of thought. But as I begin to share it with my husband, the Lord gave me a download. He says, you're going to begin to share this story. And he gave me the full blueprints for where we're at in 2018. The story goes like this. I was studying abroad. I had already graduated from university. I felt called to traditional ministry. Ministry, of course, can look anyway because wherever we are called, we are called to be ministers of the gospel regardless. But I felt called to the church. I felt called to preach. And I hadn't seen at that time a lot of women doing that, so it felt really progressive at the time. And I'm over in this other country, because like I said, I'd already received my degree. I'd worked for the in the fashion industry for a couple years, but I wasn't necessarily fulfilled as much as I enjoy fashion. It wasn't necessarily something that I saw myself doing long term. I felt a call to preach and minister. I knew I needed additional biblical training. I wanted that in my life. I go halfway, no, actually around the world, and I go to this program, it's super intense, it was great, but it, we had a really, really full schedule. But one day we had a free day, and we're in this beautiful city, so I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go see the sites. I'm gonna be a tourist in this city. I'm studying in it, but I haven't really been able to enjoy it. Of course, I'm living abroad, so I don't have a car. I don't have my license over there, and they drive on the other side of the road, so I didn't necessarily want to drive over there. Wanted to keep everyone safe. So I, draw, I jump on public transport, and the bus is probably three quarters of the way full, but I'm standing in the very back. Everyone's sitting down, but I'm the only one in the back, and I'm holding on to that pole, you know, the pole that you hang on to? So when they come to a quick stop, you don't get thrown, that pole. So I'm hanging on to that, and I don't know if I come across this way to you, but I am someone that is very aware of everything around me at all times. You may not think I see you, but I see you. You may not think I know you're there. I know you're there. I am incredibly observant of my surroundings. Because of my wiring, I saw this man as we were coming up to the next bus stop. I saw this gentleman, and he was yelling, and his hands are flailing. And I've, of course, seen that before of different people, of different you know, walks of life or whatnot. And so, but it was different than anything I'd ever seen before. It was just different. And I saw that he was incredibly... Um, possibly disturbed, and I would go as far to say there was maybe some critters on board. There wasn't just him walking down the sidewalk. And I saw this convergence moment happening where we're coming to the bus stop to let people off and let people on. And I see him beginning to pick up his pace and then begin to run. And if I'm honest and vulnerable, I'm not saying this is a great thought. I'm just saying this was my thought. And my thought was, oh, dear Lord, close the door and do not let this guy on the bus. But he got on the bus. He was the last person. And as soon as he got on the bus, the bus driver closes the door. And then he looks at us, the guy that got on, and he looks at us and he has this creepy grin and he looks at us like huh I've got you 
And what felt like just a normal day on the bus, just going from point A to point B, all of a sudden felt like a hostage situation. And what felt like no big deal, all of a sudden felt unpredictable, unsafe, and volatile. And this man began, person by person, getting in people's faces and saying hateful, derogatory, vile things, cussing people out, whatnot. And I don't know about you, but everyone on the bus, this guy was tiny. I mean, he was a small, petite man. When I saw Lord of the Rings for the first time, and the guy that was precious came on the screen, I was like, that's the guy on the bus. That's the guy. He was that small. So there were like grown men well, well bigger than him, like so much bigger than him, easily could have taken him out. But isn't it interesting that when fear comes in the atmosphere, all rationale leaves, all logic goes out the window. When fear and volatile situations and things that are unpredictable happen in our lives, all of a sudden, everyone freezes because there were so many men that could have easily taken him out. There was three quarters of a bus full, and here's this tiny little man. And the bus is frozen. I'm sitting in the back of the bus. I'm the one standing. And I'm thinking to myself, bus driver, pull over. Get this guy off the bus. Take control and authority over the situation. As I'm thinking that, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been involved in a deliverance situation, there are times where you go beyond what you see in the natural, and there is a moment where you see what's in them and they see what's in you. And that day on the bus, that happened. All of a sudden, he was going person by person, and he pops up, and he looks at me, and we lock eyes. But I wasn't locking eyes with a man. I was locking eyes with what was in him, and he was locking eyes with what's in me. And he began to make a beeline toward me. And in that moment, I, like everyone else, had been afraid. I had been paralyzed. I didn't know what to do. It felt unpredictable. It felt volatile felt a bit above my pay grade, so to speak. But without even thinking, as soon as he began to beeline toward me, without hesitation, I just stuck up my finger and I said, you're gonna shut your mouth in Jesus' name. You're not gonna say one more vile thing. You're gonna sit down, you're gonna shut up, you're gonna go to the front of the bus, and at the next bus stop, you're gonna get off this bus. I want you to know, that as soon as I said, you're going to shut your mouth, he went like this. And as soon as I said, you're going to go to the front of the bus and sit down, he went like this, all the way to the front of the bus. And then he turned around and he sat down. And at the next bus stop, he got up and he got off that bus. And the people on that bus just looked at me and I said, that's the name of Jesus. That's the power of Jesus. See, that happened years ago. I didn't think about it. A couple months ago, like I said, my husband's telling a story similar that he experienced. I said, that happened to me. Hadn't thought about it. As soon as I'm telling my story to Sean, I hear the Lord say, you're going to begin because that's exactly where the church is at. He says, right now, I'm waiting for my church to get annoyed. See, I watched him heckle, harass, torment people. And all of a sudden, I, like everyone else, was paralyzed. But when he started coming at me, I got annoyed. And I thought to myself, oh, no, you didn't just get on my bus. Oh, no, you didn't get on my bus. You're not going to take us hostage. We're not victims to what's in you. You are victim to what's in us. And the Lord said, we have to stop waiting for someone else to take authority. See, I kept waiting because remember, I'm in a foreign country. It's not my country. This isn't my demonic people. These are my demons. This isn't my bus. I'm not the one driving the bus. I'm not in control. I'm not a leader here. I don't have the authority in the situation. I'm a foreigner. I'm a foreigner on a bus in a country that I have nothing to do with. 
So I keep waiting for the local residents, the people in authority to take control of the situation. But God is saying, stop waiting for someone else to take control of the situation. Because it's time, church, that you begin to take control and get it off your bus. Because the Lord says for too long, there are things that have been on your bus that you need to stop your bus and kick them off your bus. Because you have the authority of all of heaven. And the Lord says some of those things you have inherited. Some of those things your mama had on her bus, or your daddy had on her bus, or your ethnicity has on their bus, or your nationality has on their bus, or your economic status has on their bus. Whatever it is, what, who is taking up the seats on your bus because you only have so many seats? And the Lord says, for too long, the church has allowed a hostage situation. And it's time to get annoyed. Someone else got annoyed in scripture. I want you to turn to Acts 16. We're going to look at this passage a little bit different than maybe you've ever looked at it before. Acts 16 starts in verse 16. We're going to read what seems like a familiar story, but I think the Lord's going to take it from a really different angle tonight. It says, now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaimed to us the way of salvation, and this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, say greatly annoyed. Greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and they said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach us customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. And then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Verse 25, but at midnight, say, but at midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm. For we're all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. And now when he'd brought them into his house, he set food before them. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Just a few more verses. It's important we read the full section because it, we want the full strategy. Amen? Verse 35, just a couple more. I know it's a bit long, but just stick with me. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the officer saying, let those men go. So the keeper of the prison reported those words to Paul saying, these magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. I love this, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly uncondemned Romans and have thrown us into prison and now do they want to put us out secretly no indeed let them come themselves and get us out and the officers told these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans 
Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison, entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Why am I telling you this? Because we are talking about what time is it in our history. Yes, it's revival time, but it's also time for heaven's strategy. First Chronicles 12, 32, you know this. It says, I'm just going to read part B of that scripture. All these men, I'm going to add women, understood the signs of the times and knew the best course for Israel to take. Friends, I am talking tonight about the signs of the times and understanding as sons and daughters of Issachar. We're hearing the statement over and over again, and I love it that we were born for such a time as this. The challenge is, what time is it? Because we can talk about that we're born for this time, but it means nothing if you don't know what time it is. And then even if you know what time it is, you still need to know the strategy on how to navigate the times. See, we've had a lot of people that maybe even recognize the times, but there's no GPS, so to speak. And I believe this weekend is a GPS weekend in the spirit, saying this is how you get here. I heard the Lord say that Acts 16, that portion of scripture, those 16 verses or so that we just read is the blueprint for what we are doing in this time and what he is doing in us at this time. I heard the Lord, I'm just going to do it line by line. It's a little different than normally how I preach, but just stick with me because there's a purpose in how we're going tonight. The Lord says that counterfeit spirits are going to be exposed in this time in the church. See, it's by no accident that the fortune-telling girl got delivered. See, she followed Paul and Silas around saying, these are the men of the Most High God. What she was saying was true, but it was of the wrong spirit. And the Lord says, for too long, there have been too many people that have been prophesying from the pulpits of America, that have been on lists, that have had blogs, that have had followers, maybe even TV shows. And the Lord says, I am sifting the voice, the prophetic voice, and I am exposing what is of me and what is not of me and although there has been fanfare so to speak for those that maybe have the gift but don't have the anointing or the character to have it the Lord says I am removing those gifts I don't necessarily have joy in saying this but the Lord is saying because we are in a season of exposure it is time to take inventory in our lives The flip side of that is what we have been cultivating in the secret place, in the quiet place. The Lord says, we are going to watch some Josephs come up from out of prison into the number two position. We are in a time where people are going to be sovereignly put into positions of influence and favor. They will be maybe a no name, no face. Everyone's like, who are they and how did they get there? They got there because they were on their face before the Lord for the last 20 years. And the Lord is saying, everything that is being done in the hidden place is we're about to step into a new level and a new season of exposure. See, this girl, her gift was being prostituted out. And the Lord says, my pulpit will no longer be prostituted out. There is a cleansing that is happening in the pulpit in America. And the Lord says, I have allowed in my grace and mercy, not that he ever withdraws his grace and mercy, but because of the responsibility of revival and reformation that's about to happen in this nation, the Lord is literally setting up a firm foundation to build his church on. And what is not solid, what is not secure, what is not rooted and grounded in his word, in his spirit, and his truth will be removed. I heard the Lord say there is, the word is sifting. There is a sifting that is going to begin to happen. The Lord says he and even his people, you will, I believe, sense, and many people will begin to sense there is a purifying of motives and agenda. He's like, come on, come higher. Come on, come on higher. Come on, come on higher. And there is an increased consecration, again, not out of works, but out of reverence and recognizing the responsibility of what we carry, that we have to have our agendas out of it because he will not share his glory. Yeah, come on. I heard 
someone say last night they were preaching and it's not my statement, but I love it. I'm going to borrow it and I, I hope I don't butcher it. But she said, a lot of people don't want to co-labor. They just want to co-star with God. And I heard that last night and I go, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, let us never be your co-star. Because that means we share the limelight and we share, we share the fame and we share the glory of God. It has to be about you. Oh, Lord, purify the motives of the church. Break the mentality of the Christian celebrity. Because it's not about the Christian celebrity. It's not about the gifts. It's about the one who gives the gifts. This is for his glory. You and I are not the saviors. It's Jesus who's the savior. We can't set anyone free. It's only through the blood of Jesus. But the Lord says, that fortune telling girl got delivered because I'm exposing counterfeit spirits. And this time, remember we're in a new era 2017, what was allowed, there's literally, I feel a line in the spirit and saying, no longer. <laughs> Sticking with the fortune telling girl, it was interesting that she was obviously a fortune teller, which is a counterfeit spirit. And I heard the Lord say, I'm purifying the prophetic voice that has been rooted in the wrong spirit. And there have even been people, even on a national level, that have once walked in the anointing, but because they got addicted to the accolades, the affirmation, and the fame of their gift, it has become diluted. And they're prophesying out of what they know and not out of the Spirit of God. And the Lord is saying, I'm bringing back my spirit-led prophets once again that are not led by what they see, but they're led by heaven. The third thing on the girl, and this is, I got this on the plane. The Lord says, read it again. Right? You know when you think you pull every part of it, the word just keeps opening up. Yes. He said the girl, when she got delivered, created a loss of profit. Yes. I said, okay, Lord. He says, I'm cleansing the dollar in the church again. There's been dirty money in the church. And I'm cleansing the finances because he says the pulpit's been bought. Seats at tables for prophets and apostles, those seats have been bought. I know, I'm coming pretty poo. But I'm sharing with you strategy because we're talking about revival. And if we're talking about revival, we're talking about signs of the times. We got to know where we're at. And the Lord says, I'm cleansing the finances. There's been embezzlement that's going to get exposed in this next season. There's been fraudulent funds where pastors have said it's being used for this, and the congregation has no idea, but it's being used for that. And the Lord says, what's been done in the hidden is going to be exposed. And he's not doing it to embarrass people, but he's doing it to purify his church. He's saying, I cannot trust. I cannot trust a church. The church, I'm talking general statement, big picture. I can't trust the church where it has withheld and it has buried the 200 coins, the robe of Babylon, and the bar of gold. Because what looks like an offering to the people for accolades, you actually just hid it all in your tent. And the Lord says, what's been hidden in your tent? It's coming to the surface. I don't say that to invoke fear. I say that to invoke repentance. I say, I say that to hold up a mirror for all of us and say, oh God, if I have buried anything underneath my tent and I have presented myself better than I actually am, oh God, forgive me where I have cared more about my ego, my reputation, and the accolades of man more than I have cared about your favor and my obedience to you. Oh God, forgive me. The fourth thing the Lord told me was Paul got annoyed 
Remember, we're talking about getting annoyed. The Lord told me, he said, he's allowing a holy annoyance to provoke his children. I heard the Lord say, there's a lot of my kids that are annoyed right now. And they've been speaking to the devil, saying, devil, get away from me. And the Lord says, it's not the enemy why you're annoyed. It's Father God that's allowing you to be annoyed because when you get annoyed, people get free. Because when you get annoyed, you get provoked. And when you get provoked, you get moved to action. And when you get moved to action, people get free. See, all of Acts 16 started because Paul got annoyed. It wasn't necessarily a spiritual moment. It wasn't because he had all this compassion. Is God compassionate? 100%. But it wasn't that that actually provoked it. It was because it had been trailing for days and it was harassing. And then finally Paul goes, enough. And when he said enough and the girl got free, they got put in prison unjustly. We'll speak about that in a moment. But there was a succession of events that began to take place as soon as he got annoyed. See, I feel like the Lord says for too long, call it three years, three decades, 30 years, whatever it may be, fill in the number of time. But what has been trailing you that you have allowed? The Lord says, get annoyed because you have the authority to break that, to bring deliverance. You don't have to accept that thing following you. I heard the Lord say, your annoyance is prophesying your breakthrough. What are you annoyed about? What has been ticking you off lately? I'm not talking about unsanctified fleshly annoyance. I'm talking about holy, righteous anger. We don't always talk about that. But I'm talking about holy, righteous anger that says, not in my city, not in my family, not in my marriage, not in my nation, not in my finances, not in my kids, not in my workplace. Not, no, not on my watch as an intercessor. That's not going to happen in my church. That's not going to happen to my pastors. That's not going to happen to my friends. See, there's an annoyance because when we get annoyed, we get provoked. When we're not provoked, we put up with it. We walk around. We allow it to trail us. We allow it to harass us. We allow it to intimidate us. And God is saying, stop waiting for someone else to clean up your bus. And it's time for you to clean up your own bus and take authority and get annoyed. You know, that isn't something we talk about a lot. But I heard the Lord say, I'm bringing a holy annoyance back to America. Because for too long, the church has been quiet. They've been silent. Well, I don't like that. You may not like it, but are you annoyed yet? Are you provoked yet? Is there action behind your annoyance? And I heard the Lord say, he's not going to lift the annoyance. Because I was annoyed about some things. And I said, Lord, what is this? He says, this is an assignment of intercession. Your annoyance is your tenets of intercession. And you stay on that tenet until that thing has breakthrough. And that thing is delivered. That thing is destroyed. See, when Paul got annoyed, atmospheres shifted. When you and I get annoyed, things change. Things happen. Imagine the impact. If everyone listening to this sermon tonight, in this room, online, people that even watch it after the fact, got annoyed. Imagine the change that we would begin to see in families, in workplaces, in our states, in our churches, in our nations. What if we got really annoyed about gossip? About offense? about slander, about disunity. We got really annoyed about cancer, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C. We got annoyed about diabetes. We got annoyed about poverty, at-risk kids, 
kids. What if we got annoyed about divorce? What if, what if we got annoyed about the foster care system? Like, what if we got annoyed? What if we got provoked about sex trafficking? What about the heroin addicts, the meth addicts? On there? We got annoyed for the homeless. We said, not on my city, not on my watch. We didn't just walk by them anymore. We said, I'm annoyed that that's in my city. Not on my bus. Addiction's not going to be in Peoria. This is going to be a cancer-free zone. Why? Because a church got annoyed. See, we shift atmospheres when we get ticked. And so many times we think that's the enemy. But in 2018, he says, oh, no, there's a holy annoyance in my church. Because my church has been numb. Now, am I talking about Fresh Start? No. This place is on fire. But I'm talking about the church as a whole in America has grown numb because we have been inundated with agenda after agenda. And the Lord is saying, when are you going to get annoyed? Number five. Notice Paul moved in public deliverance. He wasn't inside the four walls at a nice service when he cast the devil out of that girl with the spirit of divination. That was outside the four walls. I was just walking down the street. And I heard the Lord say, I am increasing the authority in the bride, in the church. What I love about this is we are going to begin, and I heard the Lord say, deliverance ministry is coming back to America. Here's what's really cool. I heard the Lord say, there is a generation, an older generation that has felt sidelined and displaced. And they're saying, where is my place in the church? I'm talking about the more um, senior community, but they are trained and seasoned in deliverance. I heard the Lord say, I'm taking them off the sidelines. I'm bringing them front and center. They're gonna train the younger generation that has no idea how to do deliverance. And what I love about it is deliverance is a ministry of freedom. The Lord says, I'm using a ministry of freedom to unite the generations. Oh, I love that. Deliverance is coming. The Lord says there will be an increase in churches because authority is coming back as the bride gathers. There's going to be an increase of demonic manifestations. That will become normal as the church in America gathers. What's beautiful about that is because for so long there hasn't been any power, but there's been a lot of devils sitting in the pew. And they've grown sophisticated. Don't think there's not some oppressed people sitting in our, in our chairs on Sundays or whenever we gather. But because there's been no power, they have been able to sit through our services. But the Lord says, no longer will the demonic be able to be in the presence of my church. No longer. He did the high kick. I love that. That's my favorite. My husband had this statement, and I'm going to borrow it from my husband. He says, the demonic has grown sophisticated. And the Lord, I heard him say, no longer does sophistication stand a chance when the anointing happens in the room. People think it's going to be business as usual, church as usual. And the Lord says, I am increasing the authority. So what does that mean? Churches, and for those that are listening online, get your deliverance ministry on point. Get your teams planned. Prepare in advance because the Lord says get ready because deliverance is going to sweep through the nation. And the Lord says bring the older generation off the sidelines and begin to create training opportunities. Because the Lord says I want my kids. They're only intimidated because they don't know their authority. You are not intimidated when you know who you carry within you. The enemy has no authority. 
We have scriptures. We quote it. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. But we don't believe it. We're living like Christian atheists. And God is saying, come on, I want you to begin to tap into your authority. Do you know who you are? Do you know what I, you carry? See, we've been allowing things on our bus. We've been allowing things in our churches. We've been allowing dysfunction in our ministries. And God is saying, I am sifting, I am sifting, I am sifting. I heard the Lord say sovereignly across the pulpits of America, more and more pastors are going to begin to teach on spiritual authority and deliverance. They haven't compared notes with anyone. It's just a prompting of Holy Spirit. And the Lord says that is going to be a sovereign move of pastors feeling led to teach on identity and authority. It is going to be one of the number one topics in this next era that we are going to hear in the pulpits of America because the Lord says America has to know her identity and authority. She does not know. I'm talking about the church. She doesn't know her authority. For where we are going, it is essential that we understand the blood covenant of Jesus Christ and our full inheritance. Number five, I heard the Lord say, it is not by accident that it was a girl that was delivered. The girl is the spirit of divination. The Lord says there is a women's movement that is happening in this nation. But the Lord was really specific with me about it. He said something very interesting. He talked about Esther to me, and he says there's two sides to the women's movement, just like there was in Esther's. There's an Esther movement, and there's a Vashti movement. And the Lord says, what side of history are you going to be on? And he began to speak to me that as women, the Lord says, we are called to be Esther's, and Esther only happened because there was a Mordecai. And the Lord says the Esthers were always called to be in partnership and relationship with the Mordecais that recognize the assignment, the seat, the position, the authority of the woman in this hour, aren't intimidated by it, but come alongside it. But the women have to recognize there wasn't an Esther without a Mordecai. We were never created to do it independently. We were always created to do it with men right beside us. And the Lord says there is a women's movement, but don't get caught up in the Vashti movement that is independent, that is rebellious, that is offended at men, that has a man-hating spirit in it. The Lord says don't get caught up. Don't come underneath that thing. Recognize that it has to be rooted and grounded in humility. How did Esther come? She came in humility. She came fasting, praying. She had waited on the instructions of the Lord. She had been led by the strategy of Mordecai. There is a women's movement that is happening. It is God and it is beautiful. But I feel as a woman I can speak to this and simply say, recognize what side of history you want to be on. I said, Lord, how do we know it's an Esther time? And he said, because the gallows of Haman have been erected in this nation. I said, Lord, what does that mean? Haman's name means noise, confusion, turmoil, disorder, unrest, chaos, agitation. His wife, Zeresh's name means misery and strange. He had eight sons. I can't pronounce their names, so I'll call them by number. Son number one, I didn't have time to Google it and practice the pronunciation, so that's usually what I do. The first son, his name was bitterness and judgmental. We're talking about the gallows of Haman that have been constructed. How do we know it's time for Esther to arise? It's because the agenda of Haman has been released and established in the nation. Haman is only taken down by the Esthers and the Mordecai. But what's the agenda? Bitterness, judgmental. Son number two, poison and venom. Son number three means rip apart. Son number four, his name means distraction. Son number five, his name means haughty and arrogance. Son number six, his name means gathering money to oneself. Son number seven means wrong intentions and sneaky. And this is, this is the clincher. Son number eight, his name means interpreter of the law. Selah. The gallows, gallows of Haman have been constructed. The only way 
we overcome, take down, and abolish Haman's agenda is when the Esthers and the Mordecais arise together. The women are critical in this hour, but we cannot do it without the Mordecais. And there is an invitation for increased prayer and fasting in this season like never before, because only some of these things will be, will be broken through prayer and fasting. And the Lord says, as my bride prays and fasts, there is an authority that she is going to rise up in and take authority knowing who she carries and break down the agenda and the gallows of Haman. Number six, we're talking about Acts 16. This is the blueprint for strategy of where we're talking about in this new era in the church. The Lord said, the man-pleasing spirit in the church has to get broken once and for all. What I love is Paul and Silas, they demonstrated kingdom. They weren't worried about what anyone thought. They moved in deliverance outside the four walls because, oh, deliverance is going to happen outside the four walls and inside the four walls. Absolutely. But what I love is they cast out demons in the city square, and as soon as they got put into jail, what did they do? They worshiped and they prayed. There was nothing PC about that. And I heard the Lord say they did not allow their natural atmosphere ever to determine their spiritual atmosphere. The Lord says for too long we have allowed the natural atmosphere atmosphere and the intimidation of our society to dictate how we act and move in society almost afraid like we're going to be sued for being believers and disciples of Jesus and the Lord says am I not your defender am I not your avenger do I not go on your behalf if you just call on one of my names if someone persecutes you guess what you have even more of my glory and favor for it's written in scripture, we will be persecuted. We should not run from it. We embrace it when we said yes to him being lordship of our life. We said yes to it all. I heard the Lord say the shallow self-help life coach gospel that has been being preached behind the pulpits will no longer satisfy. I heard the Lord say... There has been a life coach, and it has been satisfying up until now, but I heard the Lord say, the masses that came to get the life coaching from the pulpit are going to begin to exit the church. Again, I'm not getting, I don't have joy in saying these statements, but this is what I've heard in the quiet place. The Lord says, the presence is going to begin to trump the program, and the Lord says, where they have catered to the program, the masses, as quickly as they come, are going to begin to exit, because they're no longer going to be satisfied they're going to be looking for a true encounter with Jesus. I heard the Lord say again, I'm just sharing because I feel like the Lord wants me to say these things. He says people that have based their ministries on this will begin to see a decline because the people in this nation are wanting more than just to feel good in a pep talk. They know they need an encounter. God is raising up preachers that are going to begin to preach an undiluted gospel like never before. And I heard the Lord say, we have to be okay in this season of being misunderstood. Being the minority in a nation that views immorality as okay. We have to be okay. That man-pleasing thing has to get broken when you go to work. You, we cannot, I cannot, be different on the pulpit than I am in the grocery store. I, we, we cannot lose our witness as soon as we get behind the steering wheel. We have to be the same person. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, every moment. We, we can't just be talking about it, worshiping God, but going home and cussing out our kids in the afternoon. That there has to be a single-mindedness that you and I live in that is undiluted. I heard the Lord say, we're going, this is interesting, I heard him, this was the verbiage he said. He says, I'm bringing back a vintage Christianity. 
I said, Lord, what do you mean? He says, there's going to be a new wave, a new move of holiness and repentance that's going to flow through the church in America. I heard the Lord say the altars are going to be so packed. The pastors won't even know what to do. The janitors will want to go home. And they won't even know what to do because the people won't leave the altar. Repentance and holiness have been dirty words. And the Lord says, I'm breathing on them. There's going to be a new wave. That word Nazarite is coming back. And it's no longer going to be the stepchild of the disciple of Jesus. It's had a tainted, almost a legalistic viewpoint from some people. And the Lord says, those are my abandoned lovers. It's not out of a place of works. It's out of a place of awe of who he is. And like I talked about, identity and authority are going to be preached again. I heard the Lord say holiness and repentance are going to begin to be preached again from the pulpits in America. I heard the Lord say, I'm just reading some thoughts. The seduction of being relevant, even to the detriment of allowing compromise, will no longer be tolerated. There's been some spiritual mothers and fathers that have not gone to be with the Lord. And they're going to begin to be given platforms and pulpits again. They've been in their retirement years, but the Lord says, I'm bringing them back to the pulpits because the generations need to hear from the mothers and the fathers. It has been so focused on being young, hip, and relevant. The, The Lord says, my mothers and fathers, so to speak, in the church haven't been heard from in too long. And the Lord says, I'm bringing back the mothers and fathers to an orphan generation. Paul and Silas were singing and praising God in prison. I heard the Lord number seven, just a few more. He said, there is a reigniting of the worship and the prayer movement in America. He said, prayer gatherings are going to spontaneously pop up all over. He says the intercessors are shaking off weariness and rising up with a new zeal and focus. I heard the Lord says there's a new focus coming on the intercessors. It's like this dove's eyes. They're not even seeing peripheral vision. There is such a lock-in in the intercessor movement that's happening in America. They got weary some years ago, but there is a new breath that is happening in the intercessors. And the Lord says, I'm bringing in the younger generation because the intercessor groups have typically gotten older, but yet there hasn't been a bridge to the younger generation. The Lord says he's going to give strategy to those that lead intercession on how to bridge to the younger generation, how to train up how to tarry, how to petition, how to contend for breakthrough, not just for themselves, but for the church, for a nation, for a city, for, for breakthrough. And the Lord says, because of that, what happened in the prison cell, the subtleties of God are going to begin to happen in the church again, in, the, in America again. I heard the Lord say, because the intercession and the worship movement is being released, it releases the suddenly of God. What happened in prison? The doors opened and the chains fell. Here's what I think about when I read that. I went, oh my goodness, if I was in jail... And certainly if I was in jail unjustly, when that door opened and those chains fell, I'd be the first one out of there. I'd be like, see ya. Answer to prayer. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, that 100%. What I love is imagine a jail full of people. All you want when you are held up in bondage and in chains is freedom. Right? That's the number one thing you want. You would give anything to get those chains off you, to get that door open, to go and live your life that you were living before that happened. Right? Would you agree with me on that? So why did they stay? Because when the presence of God comes in the room, the captives get free. 
but they know they don't want to go back to what put them into bondage. So they've got to stay in that place until they touch and encounter that God that those two men are singing about. Because they know they didn't get free on their own. They know whatever they're singing about, whatever they're praying about. See, that's what's going to begin to happen to people in your workplace, to people in the church, on the streets, wherever we go. Remember, we're driving buses of life, so to speak. You're going to begin to worship and pray because you have that man-pleasing thing broken off you. You're not worried about if it sounds weird or looks weird. All of a sudden, you're walking around, you're like, I just thank you, Jesus, for freedom in this grocery store. I thank you, Lord, that you are healing hepatitis C in this aisle right now. Lord, I thank you that you are restoring marriages in Trader Joe's right now. Lord, I thank you that there is a healing outbreak that is happening in this grocery store right now. Lord, I thank you that you are touching and prophesying to the waiters and waitresses at Yard House right now. I mean, right, we begin to prophesy, we begin to pray. They don't want to leave your table. Why? Because the captive just got set free, but they don't know why. See, people are going to get around us, and they're going to get free. But they're going to want to stay and find out who and why. Who just set me free and why? Because he loves you and his name is Jesus. See, when people get around us because we shift atmospheres with our mouth, and let me tell you, what you speak in this season could not, or era, we cannot be more important and imperative. The Lord says you don't have breakthrough of what you curse. What are we speaking? Because... Paul and Silas shifted atmospheres because they praised and they worship and they exalted God. See, freedom happens when we shift atmospheres. Amen. Number eight. There's going to be more and more radical salvations outside the church. Remember the jailer ran to Paul and Silas and said, what must I do to be saved? What I love is the jailer was asleep. As the suddenly of God happened, what, what happened to him? He was awoken. The, there's a slang term, an urban term right now that's called woke. I heard the Lord say, get ready because my church is about to get woke. I'm not talking about in the urban phrase. I'm not talking about in the slang. I'm talking about woke to the things of God. Meaning, people are going to come. Again, they come in asleep. They come around us asleep in slumber. But what we carry literally provokes a suddenly of God. And those that have been in slumber are awakened. There is a woke that is going to happen in this city and in this nation. The Lord says, as my intercessors, as my worshipers, as my children come to gather, there is a suddenly of God. There's sovereign move in this era that's going to happen in America. Friends, I want you to know we're not just talking about revival history. We're talking about revival now and what's God going to do. Because we are in, I believe... The next major revival and move of God is happening right now. Whether we see it, now you are blessed, you see it, but there's a lot of this nation that is not seeing what you see, and yet we know there is an awakening that is happening. Why? Because the suddenlies of God are taking place. Why? Because the worshipers and the intercessors are coming together. And as they gather, things are sovereignly going to begin to break out. I'm going to invite some of the worship team to come up as I close this up. I heard the Lord say, healing ministries are making a comeback in America. Yeah. Decades ago, we had major healing ministries, and we had, you know, arenas and crusades, and it seems like a thing of the past. It seems a bit vintage, but remember the Lord says, I'm bringing back vintage Christianity. That's one of the things he's bringing back. I saw arenas. I saw major healing ministries happen. But it wasn't just with one person. I saw tons of people moving in the healing anointing. I feel like done are the days of the one person wonder. 
I'm talking about a church movement of people that have gotten annoyed at the agenda of the enemy and are releasing heaven. And people are coming to arenas because there's a bunch of Jesus lovers that are there that have worshiped and gathered and prayed and interceded. And when they come into the arena, the sovereignty of God moves and people get healed and set free. Last two. Number nine. God is bringing vindication to those that carry his name and proclaim his word. Remember, Paul and Silas were, be were beaten and jailed unjustly. I heard the Lord say, there's been a lot of injustice for my kids. And the Lord is saying, I will use those that have persecuted you to turn and repent and become some of your greatest advocates. I heard the Lord say, they will ask for your forgiveness. And some of your greatest enemies will be your allies. See, the jailer washed Paul and Silas' stripes after he got saved. And the Lord says, we will begin to see the mockers and the persecutors become converts. I saw those that were in legal battles. For those of you that are in legal battles, I saw those coming to an end. And I saw justice and vindication of the Lord arising over his sons and daughters. I saw verdicts overturned, debts paid, finances replenished, favor restored. I remember when the magistrates, they got afraid because Paul wouldn't leave quietly. I heard the Lord say, because they realized they mistreated a man of God. Where your reputation has been tainted, the Lord says he's going to restore reputations. And where there has been public dishonor is going to result in public honor. God's bringing vindication to those that carry his name. Lastly, and I love this, what were Paul and Silas doing? They were on a missionary trip. I heard the Lord say, I'm bringing a whole wave of missionaries to America. We have so focused on going to other nations. But I heard the Lord says, I'm bringing the nations to America. Because America needs missionaries. I want you to stand. See, we're in an Act 16 strategy season. We're talking about revival. We're talking about the times. All of this happened because Paul got annoyed. All of the sequence of events took place because a man got annoyed. It would have been business as usual. The jail would not have been free. The jailer and his family would not have been baptized, given their lives to the Lord. That would have not happened had someone not gotten annoyed. That girl would have stayed in bondage, but someone got annoyed. I'm going to pray a dangerous prayer tonight. I'm going to pray for holy anoints to be released in this room tonight. Because if you're not already provoked, you need to get provoked. Because the Lord's saying things are going to change when my kids get annoyed. So I want you to raise your hands. If you want to get annoyed, if you want a holy provoking, Lord, I call forth right now that holy God-given annoyance where we are forced to confront things that contradict your promises and who you are. Lord, forgive us for where we have tolerated, where we have turned and looked the other way. We have not wanted to take responsibility. Tonight, God, we say we take responsibility. We will not turn and look the other way. God, Get us annoyed, get us provoked. And where we have become numb, God forgive us and awaken us. I call forth right now a release, Lord, of your holy annoyance in the house tonight. And Lord, I pray right now, discernment and strategy 
on how to deal with the annoyance. Not in our own flesh, not in our own agenda, but with the strategy of heaven. I ask you, God, to release an Acts 16 mandate in this house. Lord, I ask you to release a vintage Christianity. Lord, I ask you to do the sifting in our lives for we where we have allowed a double-mindedness. God, purify our motives and purify our agendas. I ask you, Jesus, to move in the people right now and encounter, 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 God. Release it in Jesus' name. You know, when a snake jumped up and bit Apostle Paul, the Bible says he shook it off. When Samson felt like the Philistines was on him, it says that Samson got up and he shook himself. There's something about recognizing when the enemy is beginning to encroach, encroach that you shake yourself. Shaking yourself is activating the anointing of God. I want you in a moment just to begin to stir yourself up, just to begin to activate. I feel like as we do it, I feel like the Lord is breaking off passivity I feel like some of us have been passive in areas and we've allowed the enemy to take back territory that we had received and won back. And I feel like the Lord is also breaking off a settling spirit. I see it on some shirts that say, we won't settle. Sometimes when you first start off, your settling is here, but when you experience increase, your settle could be here, but you're still settling. Because if God is calling you to here, anything less than there is settling. So I want you to begin to shake yourself. Come on, shake yourself. Stir yourself up. Stir up that anointing of the Most High. Stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. I feel like there are going to be some undeniable healing miracles, prophesy, flow, and that could still happen tonight. But I just saw this vision of people just coming to the altar and getting on their face and getting back. This thing of holy annoyance, I think it's more important than we know. This thing of being provoked, I love the way she said it. They says like, devil, we're not going to let you have the final word. We're not going to let you drive this thing. We're not going to let you do whatever it is you've been doing in the area of robbing us. And I believe it begins with our own passion. It begins with our own standards. It begins with this thing. And, it, and again, it's not working harder. It's moving closer. It's saying, God, I want to move nearer to you. I'm not going to settle with being a distance away from you. If you're saying you're hungry for the more, you refuse to settle. You are drawing a line in the sand and you're saying, devil, you got to back up, back off, back away because I'm not stopping. I want you to get up. I want you to find a place in this altar. I want you to get before the Lord. And as you're doing it, I believe the oil that my wife saw in the spirit while she was on the plane, I believe a new oil is being poured upon fresh start and those that have visited us. Receive this fresh oil that the Lord, I feel like, the prophet Samuel is pouring over you, the youngest son of David, this flask of oil. We're saying we won't settle. We're saying, God, we refuse to be passive. We're saying, Lord, we're declaring war on what the enemy has done. We're saying, God, 
by Jesus, we are being manifested in this hour that we might destroy the works of the enemy. As they begin to sing right now, let that oil just begin to be poured on you and be to declare right now, you're breaking all neutrality with darkness. And if it begins with the air of your heart, it says, God, I gotta get this thing right because it is a season of exposure. I want you to do business with God and say, Lord, I'm leaving this thing at the altar. What is done in secret will be in the market. So that's good and bad. The bad part we are aware of. The good part is, God, because we have sown faithfully in secret, you're going to give to us. So right now, as the worship team just begins to sing, Lord, let that oil just begin to pour right now. Let that oil begin to flow right now. Begin to pour right now. Begin to stir. Lord, we prayed encounters would happen this night. We pray that there would be divine encounters. There'd be visitations under habitations. We declare that the Holy Spirit would come upon you begin to shake you, begin to stir you right now as the team begins to worship again. Holy Spirit, flood these altars. Flood these altars, Lord.
just stay in this place? I don't want us to leave this place because I feel like there's just encounters that are happening. But I heard the Lord say, he is cleaning up your bus right now. And specifically in the area of physical healing, I heard the Lord say, some of you need to kick off the spirit of infirmity off your bus. And I heard chronic conditions, generational things that have been in your family line. Tonight the Lord says, kick it off your bus and you're gonna see total and complete healing. And that thing is gonna be broken and not passed on to the next generation. So if you have chronic conditions, I want you just to raise your hand right now because as you raise your hand, you're saying, I'm kicking it off my bus. Lord, you see every hand that's raised right now. And we just take authority over the spirit of infirmity and we break its stronghold in the name of Jesus. And we kick it off our bus and we say, spirit of infirmity, you no longer have any authority in my family line. From this day forward, I declare health, healing and wholeness by the blood of Jesus over my body, over my family line, that this curse is broken and never to return to another generation. In Jesus' name, as we go back into worship, I want you to begin to ask the Lord, is there anything on my bus that needs to get kicked off? Because right now we are cleaning buses. being on the bus and at first she felt as well as everyone on that bus felt intimidation I feel like right now God wants to break intimidation if you've been intimidated on stepping out in your gift if you've been intimidated on sharing your faith if you've been intimidated uh, by strong personality types or dysfunctions in your family or you've been intimidated to express what you know to be true you've been intimidated by simply the enemy trying to drive you back that you're afraid if you really get on fire for God, you really go after God, man, all double H-E double hockey sticks breaks out. Any level where you feel like intimidation has been trying to deactivate you from authority or steps that you need to take, I want you right now just to lift your hand right now wherever you're at. Oh man, okay, all right, all right. We sing this song, we just wanna pray. Father. Lord, your word says you have not given us a spirit of timidity, but one of power, of love, and a sound mind. In the name of Jesus, by the authority of the blood of the Lamb, I break the spirit of intimidation off of you in Jesus' name. We say the fear of man, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of the unknown, the fear of making a mistake. We declare it no longer has power over you. We declare that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is now alive in you. We declare you are not intimidated because of what happened. 
happened when you were six years old, 12 years old, 17, young Mary, we declare you are a new creature in Christ Jesus who will not settle. generation of boldness 
So if you're under the age of 15 with your hands raised, well, Lord, we just call forth that encounter right now. There's an impartation. There's an infilling. There's an infusing. And as that happens, I just saw intimidation and insecurity coming off once and for all. I just see breakthrough happening for this younger generation where they have been held up with insecurities. The Lord is saying, freedom to be who you've been called to be. Freedom to be who you've been called to be. Freedom, 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 freedom. No more insecurity. No more insecurity. No more insecurity. Total and complete freedom. Total and complete freedom in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Free, free, free. No more insecurity at the core of who you are. I declare freedom to be who you have been called to be. Freedom, 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 freedom. No more insecurity. No more insecurity. Come on, church, pray with me. Just begin to pray in the spirit. Come on, we're calling forth for the next generation. Shut up, akara bakoko. No more insecurity. No more comparison. Total freedom to be who you've been created to be. Under the age of 15, put your hands up. Let me see you. There we go. A couple more back there. Come on. Keep praying in the spirit. Come on. Freedom. 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 Freedom to be who you've been created to be in Jesus' name. Now. 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 In Jesus' name. The core. We uproot anything that has caused comparison or insecurity to be uprooted now. Now. Freedom. 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 In Jesus' name. Freedom, 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 freedom. Lord, that this will be a generation that will not be intimidated, that will not walk in comparison, but they will be infused and filled with Holy Spirit. Lord, we call forth the Parisia generation. And we declare and we decree freedom to be who they've been created to be, knitted in their mother's womb. Is there anyone over here under the age of 15? I want you to raise your hands. Anyone over here? We want to get our hands on you. Where's Rachel? Where's Rachel? Where's my Rachel? I know you're here. It's okay, I have a really encouraging word for you. Where's Rachel? I know this happens and then they'll come up to us afterwards and say, I felt kind of weird. It's okay, you don't need to feel weird. What I love about this is is Jesus calling you out by name. Rachel, where are you? Can you just wave your hand to me so I can see you? I won't spend too much longer. I know you. It's all right. You don't have to save me. I'm super comfortable being out on the branch. And if it cracks and I don't get caught, it's cool because Jesus always catches me. It's good. I have no problem taking risks. 100%. Remember, we gave him our ego. We gave him our reputation. It's not about us looking awesome. It's about him getting all the glory. It's okay. If your name is Rachel, find me afterwards. I have a word for you. Amen. Is that you? Your sister? stick with that. I feel like they're here, like they're here. It could be, you know, you're right. It could be online. Your name's Rachel? Girl, girl, get up here, Rachel. You made me work for that one. 
I was hanging, I was like, I know you're here, Rachel. I mean, I, woo, that was like, but again, you know, Sean and I are really comfortable taking risks because we never increase our capacity for the prophetic if we stay in our safe zone. So you have to take risks, and it's not about what you look like. It's about just saying, Jesus, I know you said it, so I'm just going to walk out in it. Right? Rachel! Oh, I threw you off. She said, you said my Rachel. I did say my Rachel, because you are my Rachel, because I got your name. Fair enough. I'll, I give you a full pass. You're all good. I know it's a little intimidating. Just close your eyes. Focus on Jesus, because this is about you having an encounter with Father. It's not about me. This is all about you. That's what I heard the Lord say, so I, I repeated it. I heard him say, my Rachel. So I, I repeated that. The Lord says she's a world changer. call on you to go to the nations, the coming, the going, the going, and the coming. The Lord's called you to preach his word. It's not always going to be inside the four walls and certainly going to be outside the four walls. The Lord says she's not intimidated by the dark places or the dark people, but you're called to shine his light. I heard the Lord say the darker it gets, the brighter she shines. And it's because you don't walk in intimidation because you know darkness has no power or force. It's simply the absence of light. So when light comes into where darkness is, darkness has to flee. And I heard the Lord say, nations are calling your name. And there's already some nations that the Lord's put in you. But get ready because you're literally going to feel beckoned to nations. And it's going to sound funny, but I hear you even saying the statement like, it's calling my name. The nation is calling my name. I have to go there. You may not live there, but there's the coming and the going and the going and the coming. And the Lord has given you assignments. The Lord says, I'm going to take care of every logistic. Because logistics have been an issue. They've been a place of worry and concern. And God's like, I've got your family. I've got the finances. I've got it all. Don't worry about it. I've got it. The people that you're close to in your life, I feel like there is this, you want to make sure everyone's okay. And God's like, trust me, I got them. You've got to be about your assignment. See, tonight was about marking you. And you've already been marked, but I feel like the prophetic word simply highlights the call on your life. Because you're with a community of believers. So one of the purposes of public prophecy is so it creates an accountability within the family of God where we remind each other what we're called to carry. And from this moment on, you're going to be reminded of what you carry for the nations. From this moment on, it's not business as usual. From this moment on, you've been marked to be a carrier of his gospel and his word. That worshiper in you, that creative gift in you that he's given you, watch him begin to unfold it. And interestingly enough, the Lord's given you the gift of problem solving. You're gonna walk into situations and they need solving. The Lord says that administrative gift in you to problem solve, to troubleshoot, it's of the Lord. See, Joseph was an administrator. We forget that. But he got the strategy of heaven of how to avoid a famine and save a nation. That's administration. That's problem solving. Lord says tonight was about you encountering the strategy room of heaven of what you're carrying to the nations and to be publicly marked for what you're called to carry. So we extend our hands as a company of believers and we affirm the gift, the call, and the mandate. And the Lord says the healing anointing in you is going to 
go to the nations. You are going to lay your hands on the sick, on the dying, on the broken, on the lost and the forgotten and the marginalized. And the Lord says, as you lay your hands, my light is going to shine. And the Lord says, villages and cities are going to come to know my name because of the healing anointing that is going to come through your life. Just close your eyes. Jesus, we give you glory right now. We just take a moment. We're like that one leper that returns. And God, we're expressing gratitude. We don't ever want to take for granted that the, the quality of the outpouring of the Spirit is taking place in this house. And God, the depth of, Lord, the prophetic that you're releasing upon a generation. This is their norm. They. They, they're revival babies. This is all they know. And we're so grateful, God. This is, they're a sign that this is a generation that this is their norm, God. Lord, we thank you that they got to get stuck in dead religion and that became their norm, God. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just bless you. We bless you. We bless you. I think my, my brother in a, a uh, white polo, look like you got some cool stuff on it. Are you in school right now? Yes. Don't even tell me. Okay, I was going to ask another question. Just lift your hands up. I see you at a poll, but I I, I kind of was dialoguing with the Lord. I feel like it was more than just see you at a poll like once a year, see you at a poll, peace out, deuces, you know, I'm praying. I felt like the Lord was in fact, you're at a poll, but it wasn't that you were just standing over a pole of a flag that already represents the school or the state, but that you were erecting a flag like you had taken territory. And I feel like the, the school that you're at, God is saying, I'm giving you territory. You're like a Joshua. Every place the sole of your foot has tread, God has given it to you. I feel like the Lord, and I'm thinking of a pole, also in a pole vaulter, that God says, for by your God, you'll run through a troop and leap over a wall, that there'll be no boundaries that will hold you back. Favor is coming upon you in this season. Authority is coming on you in this season. And there, right there, there is a gift of faith that's coming on you that I've seen come upon literally uh, young men and young women that begin to see revival break out at their schools. I declare now a gift of faith, a prophetic, literally paradigm, paradigm to see what it is that the Lord is doing and to begin to speak. John 5, 19 and 20 is your scripture. Jesus said, he says, the son can do nothing of himself, but only that which he sees the father do. And that which the father does, the son does likewise, because the father loves the son and shows him all things he himself does, will show you greater works than these you may be more, that you may marvel. The Lord is going to begin to open your eyes to see what the father is doing so you can join in and release I declare right now, prophetic evangelism is on you. I declare right now, the gift of healing is on you. I declare right now, supernatural faith that suspends doubt is on you. And I declare the marking of a revivalist comes upon your life now! Come on, keep praying over, keep praying over, keep praying over, keep praying over. New marching orders, new marching orders, new marching orders. Secretary Andorra, influencer, leader, catalyst, revivalist, spokesman. Who's born in the month of June? I want you to raise your hands. Birthday, June birthday people. Huh, yes, that's right. Yes. I love that. Yes. Oh, awesome. I knew one of you was going to have a June birthday, so I love Kim. As Pastor Kim has a June birthday. I just want you to keep your hands up. If you have a June birthday, I just heard the Lord say, this is going to be the year you've been praying for. This is the year you have been praying for. If you have a June birthday, I feel like this is a year that has been a long time coming in the spirit. This is for every June birthday. 
I knew one of the pastors had a June birthday. But I heard the Lord say, get ready because it's what you've been praying for. And the Lord says, I'm removing delay. And the Lord says, if, for those that have the June birthday, begin to dream like you've never dreamed before. Remember we talked about breaking boxes at the beginning of the service tonight. I heard the Lord say, that's for everybody, but that's also for my June birthdays. There has been boxes that have been lived in. And I forgot my husband for a moment had a June birthday. When you're moving in the prophetic, you're not necessarily thinking what's in the natural. So I love this. I'm prophesying over him too. But I heard the Lord say the boxes that have been normal and been living in those, the Lord's saying, break the boxes and begin to dream again. Things that only you know God can do. Don't stay in the safe zone. Because the Lord is saying, June birthdays, get ready. It's the year you've been praying for. You too. Dimsy's last name, right? Grab hands. There's something for June on you too. I don't think either of you responded on the birthday thing, but I heard the I saw the month June stamped as a banner over the two of you. I heard the Lord say, June, get ready, 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 June, get ready. Because there's an impartation in your family. There's something about June in your home. There's a breakthrough that's going to happen in the month of June. worship as I just prophesied over them there's breakthrough coming in there's still something about June I felt a ping in the spirit ping p-i-n-g that means when I released it it ricocheted off which I know it's for other people in this room if you need breakthrough and when I release that word about June being a breakthrough month I want you to receive it because I felt like the Lord says breakthroughs coming in June what's interesting it's only a month away there's something about the month of June it's halfway through 2018 it marks the six month mark of this new era and God is saying if you felt that resonate in your spirit as I release that again there was a ping in the spirit grab it because I believe the Lord is prophesying breakthrough in the month of June
We're gonna do. I'm gonna do this, and, and and because it's so familiar to us at Fresh Start Family, I almost didn't do it, and I was just saying, no, no. It's it, because it's so familiar to us. How many know we preach hard and heavy around here? When something starts getting familiar, that's when you need to. Amen. And if there's one thing that annoys me, there's one thing that provokes me, is when Holy Spirit is not given priority in church. Come on, y'all. When Holy Spirit is not, we don't let Holy Spirit move in our spirit-filled services, in our spirit-filled churches. And I know there's other pastors here tonight, and you just stay right where you are, but just lift your hands, and we're going to go to war before we leave here. Y'all help me. Come on. We're going to go to war for the territories where the enemy has closed the heavens, and the principalities and powers of darkness has shut down the move of the Spirit and the manifestation of the power of God. We're going to go to war tonight. I need this right now. Come on. If there's one thing that annoys me, if there's one thing that provokes me, is when Holy Spirit is told that He can't move and that He can't be present. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we go to war and we say in Phoenix, Arizona, in the state of Arizona, in the territory of Arizona, in the Southwest region, in the nation of America, we will not settle for status quo church. We will not settle for a spirit-filled church that has no Holy Spirit. We will not settle in the name of Jesus. We stand in our authority and we take back what is rightfully ours and we say Holy Spirit in a rock Schedules, interrupt our denominations, interrupt our agendas and our programs, and bust through and explode in our churches. We call territories and cities free in the name of Jesus from anything that is shut down revival. And we say and prophesy, let Shake it, take it, take it, take it, take it, 
speaking over their territory, speaking over their churches. We won't settle. We won't settle. Horebe Kasata. Those of you who are watching online tonight, sing this with us. Make it your prayer, make it your declaration. Prophesy over your church. Prophesy over your people. Prophesy over your city. Don't give in to status quo. Don't give in. 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 going to begin to burn in your church and it's going to burn in your city very very early in what God is doing here he spoke to us and said this will be a revival of fire it's supposed to be passionate it's supposed to be loud it's supposed to be aggressive because it's fire it's fire it's fire And I believe the fire of God. You may not feel it right now. You may not sense it right now. But I just feel like when you get up in your pulpit this coming Sunday, fire. You can see, where has that been? Your people aren't even going to know what to do with you. You're going to be so hot, they're going to touch you and get third degree burns. You're going to burn so hot. Jesus name amen wow what a night what a night thank you Krista I, I don't know what to call you I was like trying to put a title in front of that name it's like prophetess uh, apostle uh, for the first time in my life I was like man I wish that was born in June that was like so cool No, really, seriously, I want to I wanna honor her. Amen, what an amazing word. Thank you so much. Just the courage, just the courage to share that. Amen. Amen, it's so powerful. 